that so much in John chapter 3 in your Bibles, if you find that, John chapter 3, and if you can find that, and the book of Ephesians chapter 3, we'll look at a couple of verses in Ephesians as well, and uh, as we near the end of 2019, I just say thank you for being here, very grateful you're here, as well as some of our teenagers here this morning are Young people matter so much. Um, Natasha was, how old were you, Natasha, when you started coming? She was 10 when she started coming to our church. A couple of our folks knocked on her parents' door. And um, for you that are from North Valley, that's Sean Jackson's sister. Tie in problem people with one another. And I'm um, very, very grateful for the young people who've grown up found jobs and served and invested. Natasha teaches for us in our Christian school. So if you find, um, you've got Ephesians, right? Ephesians 3. You've got John chapter 3. Ready? One more. That's two fingers. Now find Luke chapter 2. No, oh, I don't know if you can find three Bible verses at the same time. But you can do this just for, for the Lord because it's Christmas and it's when we celebrate Jesus' birthday. Luke chapter 2. I've lost all mercy on people who can't find their way around their Bible. Anytime you go into a home where there's three TV remotes, you should be able to find any book in the Bible. If you can figure out TV remotes, you can figure out 66 books that never change. And you go in there and, it, and the TV changes. And no one even knows it's these little decent, the, the devil's been called the prince and power of the air and he rearranges things. Uh, some of you young people don't know how good it is that the only TV remote was Bruce, go turn it to channel 9. Oh, yeah. You know, and I'd get up and go, go click, click from 11 to 9, and that's, that's the TV remote. And uh, when, when I was a teenager, we had, I think we had three TV channels, and that was it. That was three more than we needed. All right, let's stand together. Flip your phones off if you wouldn't mind, or to silent. I don't have very much time this morning. We've had some extras. Luke chapter 2, very familiar. The story of our Savior's birth. Look down at verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 11. The angels are speaking to the shepherds. Verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. Let me stop for a minute. Boy, we are in a world that wants everything about Christmas except Christ. Isn't that something? I mean, they want trees and lights and gifts and love. And and uh, you ever notice these anorexic skinny people on Hallmark shows that they can always be eating muffins, ice cream, and drinking overfat coffees, and they're still scrawny? TV's a lie, folks. It's all a lie. You eat like they eat, you look like us. <laughs> That's your spiritual truth for the day, all right? But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, back to verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And verse 14, if you look there, the angels show up. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men. We love the word peace and, and uh, like we like like we like the word connect. I'm cutting the word connect out of my dictionaries. It's just an irritating word to me. I don't like trendy things. It, you know, come we don't have visitors cards at church. We have connect cards. Alright, go ahead. I'm not gonna be panic stricken. This it's Christmas. I'm gonna be nice. But anyway, anyway, connect. I saw a bar yesterday. A bar grill connect. Probably as spiritual as the other places. But anyhow, I want to talk to you this morning about the price of peace. He said in verse 14, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And as we say often in America, freedom isn't free. I'd like to say to you today, peace isn't free. Somebody paid a very high price. That we can have peace. Father, bless these moments today. Help us. May there be a truth, a spiritual truth put into our hearts. We pray for the children. All right now, the Bible's open before them that they too would gain some wisdom and some biblical truth. This world's a big lie. This world will rob us of every bit of happiness, rob us of our hope, rob us of our potential. 
And every young person, every adult in this room and in our classes matters so much. You have a plan for all of us, a good plan. But we need you. We need to keep you up in front. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bibles open for a moment. And I'm going to pass through scriptures you are not looking at. But if you'll follow me this morning, just quickly for a couple of things. We're going to take the, we all know about the love of God. We know very little about it, but we do. We're familiar. God so loved the world. And so we've got on this side of the platform a loving God. A God who showed his love on Calvary. He showed his love uh, in God so loved the world. He gave his son. And that's what we talk about during this time of year. God gave his son to die for our sins. Over on the other side of the platform, we've got us. And we'll talk about us in a minute. If you're there in John chapter 3, let's just look at a couple of verses that talk about who we are. John chapter 3, and I'm still in Luke 2 because I didn't have enough fingers. John chapter 3, if you look down there with me at verse 18. John chapter 3, we all know verse 16, that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Notice before you put your faith in Christ, you're condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Uh, one of the distinctives of a Baptist church, and of any Bible-believing church, is we believe salvation and baptism is a believer. We call it believer's baptism. Um, like I did in the Lutheran church, and many of you in different religions, we were sprinkled as a baby. And you, you can move your way into church membership without ever having a, a personal trust in Jesus Christ. And um, sprinkling water on a baby's head does not make him religious. It makes him wet. And it, it soothes the, the conscience of some adult who's trying to do the best they know how because they've not had a pastor teaching the Bible. But um, the Bible says, He that believeth not is condemned already. We were born dead in trespasses and sins. We'll see just a moment. Look on to verse uh, 36, the last verse of the chapter there. He that believeth on the Son, John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath, present tense, hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we find out that without your faith in Christ, you're condemned already. And without faith in us, um, let me just preface for those who would uh, mistake things, uh, a little one born... Um, doesn't know sin, has not been a rebel, has not chosen to sin. Um, anybody, any Bible believer I know of believes there is a, a window of, of, a, of knowledge and lack of knowledge and no one would think a child is condemned. But we are all born lost without that new birth. And when we get to the age when we understand, people use the term, the age of accountability, it's not a Bible term, but whatever they want to call it, there's a point when you know you're a sinner. There's a point you know you're in trouble. At that point, if you don't get saved, you're lost and you can't get to heaven. You'll end up in hell. But we're born, we're born sinners. And he that believeth not, it says in verse 36, is condemned already. He that hath the Son, uh, hath life, he that hath not the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we're born and we grow up. At 18 years old, I was still not a Christian. I believed in God, believed the Bible. I never read it. Um, I believe there was a heaven and a hell, but I, I had no idea whether, uh, how you got saved or how you got your, you know, how do you, I remember thinking 70% uh, gets you a C in class. What, what grade gets you into heaven? And no one ever told me that. So this is where we are. In the eyes of God, I was a condemned sinner. And over here, there's a loving God. And over there, there are lost sinners. God so loved the world. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter three, just for a moment. Let's go to Ephesians 2, might be, uh, let's go to chapter 2, be quicker there. Ephesians 2, we'll just skip chapter 3 for the sake of time. But look at chapter, Ephesians chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were what? Dead. dead. That's what we were, dead in trespasses and sin. We were born and we grew up. No one had to teach us to lie. No one had to teach us to steal, to cheat. It's so funny. I love having little kids around. Our granddaughter's two. And, and uh, last night we're eating cookies and cake and ice cream and all kinds of things. And, and uh, so uh, her mom, Esther, my daughter, says to Kimmy, the two-year-old, uh, that she'd had enough. No more ice cream. 
and the, the bowl is empty. She wanted to you know you had enough. So she goes walking over to my wife and says, Nana, what do you have? <laughs> and she said, your mom said you'd had enough. And she, she goes over to my mom, to great grandma, great grandma. Mmm. <laughs> From the womb. <laughs> they know. You know, that two-year-old knows way more than most parents give him credit for, right? We all understand that. And in Ephesians 2, 1, you have been quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know, we're born a body and a soul. The soul is maybe through lack of it, the easy term of personality. The body, what we live in, the soul, it's what we like and who we are, our emotion, our intellect, our will. And when you get born again, that's when the Spirit of God meets the Word of God and faith in our heart. And a new creature is born inside. That's the Spirit. So we're a body and a soul. And then we get born again. Now there's a Spirit inside me. And that thing, until I'm born again, he says in verse 2, You have a quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin. Whereas in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Now he's about to describe us in verse 2. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, all of us, we had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know, here we, Merry Christmas, by the way. Here we are. We're children of wrath. We're selfish, we're greedy, we're, we're wanting to be the biggest kid in the playground. We want that kid's lunch, and we want that person's car. And, and whether we're 10 years old or 40 years old, covetousness and envy and jealousy and bitterness. And, and, and we have a holy God, so holy and so pure. And God looks over there, and there is a, a, a gulf beyond description between the sinfulness of men the holiness of God. There is no hope. There is no hope. Man could not. You can baptize him. You can put him in church. You can give him catechism and confirmation. And you can, you can sprinkle him in every church in the city. And the bottom line, they're sinners. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So we've got a loving God over here. We've got a sinful humanity, all of us over there, and someone's got to come in the middle and join these two. And God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever joineth the Baptist church and tithes, quits their smoking, cussing, chewing. No, it doesn't say anything about that, does it? That whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The most amazing things in all the world is that Jesus came and he reached over to the hand of a, of a holy God and he reached over to a, a sinful man and said to that sinful man, I will pay what you owe him. Yeah, right. And let me tell you something, you don't even know how in debt you are. Yeah, right. And he reaches over to that sinful man, he holds out a nail pierced hand and says, I would love to pay your debt and introduce you to my father. And he reaches over a nail pierced hand to a father and says, Father, I've died for them and I, and I want you to know that I'm willing to take all their sin and pay their sin debt if they're willing to accept me and trust me and let me do that for them. Well, God's in this thing. If you back over there to Luke chapter 2, where we were a moment ago, if you now I'm making you go to another place in the Bible. No, it's the same place. It's not another place. You just lost it. You lost your place, but in Luke chapter 2. And suddenly, in Luke chapter 2, he says to the angels in verse 12, this shall be, Luke chapter 2, verse 12, this shall be the sign. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill. What's that next word? From eternity, Tyron, come on up here. I'll use you because you're a good heathen. And, uh, he'll, uh, he'll, be, he'll be sinful man. Now, here's what happened in the Garden of Eden. There's Adam. I'll be God. And we're friends. 
And Adam listens to the girl. <laughs> and he rebels and turns his back on God. When he did that, he's waiting for him to hit him or something. <laughs> God turned his back on man. So you go over there a little further where sinful men have been ever since. And this is where God was. And then we need, we need Jesus, Pat. Can you come up and be Jesus? And that, and by the way, if it was left like this, every man would go to hell. Yeah. Doesn't matter who they are. In comes Jesus. And my back is toward sinful men. But when Jesus died, now you've got to turn me around here. He turns me around because Jesus, he's on this side of this. Oh, there guys, they're a mess still. Peace on earth. Goodwill what? God now is toward. God now has goodwill because of Jesus. There's goodwill toward men. And you know what? There's peace. Because he was, Ephesians chapter 2, a child of wrath. Remember what we read there? We were by nature children of wrath. This guy was born under the wrath of God. That's not peace. That's terrible. But because Jesus comes along, now God turns toward men. And now there's peace, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So he and I are in agreement. If you'll pay their price, which you did, I'm willing to accept your payment on their behalf. Now you're going to have to convince them to do it. So go ahead and grab him. See if he's smart enough to come over here. Oh, look at there. And now because of Jesus, there is goodwill toward men. And now there's peace on earth. And having made peace, the book of Galatians says, through the blood of his cross. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let me just quickly say this. Here's the whole sermon. Colossians 1.20 says this, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile, to write, to reconcile all things to himself, we get peace. But that was a very expensive. If you, you take your family to Disneyland, they don't have any idea how many weeks you had to work to pay for that. <laughs> uh, they, those young people have no clue at $120 a pop and $6 frozen bananas dipped in chocolate. And now that's worth it. But uh, that's my favorite thing at Disneyland is the frozen bananas. You know? Go get a banana for 20 cents, dip it in the dimes with a chalk, and you can have the same thing at home, but it's just different. <laughs> Peace, he says there in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. See, because of Calvary, we're accepted in the beloved. Because of Calvary, we're forgiven. Because of Calvary, we have peace. You go back 2,000 years ago, and I don't know if this is the right time of year, but you know symbolically as we would look at it, Joseph and Mary, they lost their reputation so you and I could have peace. Mary, Jesus is an adult in his 30s, and the Pharisees said to Jesus, we be not born of fornication. Mary is... 45, 50 years old, still considered an adulteress. They had to travel at nine months pregnant on who knows what kind of animal from Nazareth down the Jordan Valley and up the hill to, to Jerusalem and down to Bethlehem and, and nowhere to put the, the child because her husband doesn't know what, what Airbnb is or Hotels.com and they're in a stable and and uh, look, there's no midwife, there's no mother, there's no grandma, there's no one there to be a help. It was not long before they were told by the angels to run for their life. And Joseph takes Mary and, and Jesus is about two at the time. And, and they run off to Egypt and now they're immigrants, now they're in a foreign country. Why did they have to go do that? For our peace. Having made peace through the blood of his cross from the, it wasn't just Calvary, it was the manger, it was his childhood, it was growing up after years of living in Egypt. Finally they get word from the angels, they go back and they realize that the wrong people are still in leadership. So they go from Jerusalem up to Nazareth and resettle there. And the pressure that's on a dad. Can I pay the bill? <clears throat> and we know everything's alright, right? 
I mean, we're, we're reading the story from 2,000 years. We say, oh, it's fine. You're going to go to Egypt. You're going to come back. Jesus is going to die. But he's going to raise again three days later. Not when you're in it looking forward. All the fears you feel, all the worry you feel, all the... You know, I was looking at one of our... I love just looking at our teenagers, thinking about us, thinking about one of our teenagers with some burdens. And I thought, they're going to be fine. They don't know that. Yeah. I do. I'm sure they'll be okay. They'll, they'll make it. But they don't feel that. And how do you communicate? That God is faithful. How do you communicate that God will see us through? That's where Mary and Joseph lived. That's where Mary and Joseph lived every day. Can you see them at 12 years old? They travel from Bethlehem, from, from Bethlehem, from Nazareth, down to the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and up to Jerusalem. And they, the feast days are there and Passover. And, and Jesus wanders away. to didn't wander away. Exactly what wander is not a good word. He, he left them. And he's, he's in the temple with the priests asking questions, answering questions. Mary and Joseph are a couple of days gone. They realize we've lost really not a good thing when you lose God's son. It's like, you know, if you ever babysat for somebody, our daughter uh, Hannah was babysitting for someone, and I don't know what it was going on, and she went outside, the kids were sleeping in the house, and she went outside, and the door shut, had automatic locking doors. <laughs> Her cell phone was inside. Everything's inside. <laughs> what do you do? Just bust the window. <laughs> And you know everything's going to be okay, but you know what? There are those hours in life when you wonder, is it, is, is it going to be okay? Boy, God up in heaven is looking down saying, it's going to be fine. I got this. I, God looks at the teenager and says, I'll, I'll be fine. I'm going with you through this. You'll be all right. He's looking at the college student, to the young married person, or the young person getting married, the person looking for work, the person who had a good job and lost it. And, and God says, look. I'm already in here tomorrow. It's going to be okay. I'll see you through this. Thing. You may look back and, and uh, you may have been in and maybe still waiting through some difficult hours. But could I tell you? He knows. He knows right where you are. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to forsake you. Amen. That little manger, or those, those, that little, I mean, the first child. Far from home. And the husband. You know, you know what the husband does when the first child is being born? He has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> he doesn't have a clue. He's walking around the manger talking to cows. <laughs> Best thing ever happened to him was when those wives, when the shepherds showed up. Oh good, somebody I can talk to. <laughs> Peace on earth. Peace on earth and mercy, my old God and sinner. Reconciled. Man, I'll tell you, that peace was expensive. It cost the Heavenly Father his son. It cost his son his home. It cost 33 years away from home, and we send missionaries off across the world, and we've got <clears throat> we've got FaceTime and We've got internet. We've got all kinds of ways to communicate. We've got planes. And in most countries, we've got embassies where within a matter of hours, we can be safe and we can be moved from point A to point B. And the worst of all, we go to heaven. 33 years, Jesus was away from home. There was fighting against the powers of darkness. There was an evil world. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works that devil. You know, Jesus came to fight your battle. Jesus came to fight our battle with sin, to fight our battle with the devil, to fight our battle with the flesh, to fight our battle with eternal condemnation. And Jesus reaches out and says, let me just tell you something. I, I've secured your peace. When he hung on that cross and said, it is finished. Let me tell you something. It was finished. Amen. The battle's over. And the victory's been won. It was hard. I say to you young people who grew up in Christian homes, you have no idea the fight this world has.
has waiting for you. You need to stay near him. Because this is an ugly old world. You need to cling to him and walk with him. And there is peace through the blood of his cross. Titus chapter 2 says this, and I'll close, but after that in the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man here. See, God's kindness and love is toward you. you. Say, well, it's been an ugly world. That's why we need Jesus. It's an ugly world. So what about all this mess in the world around us? It, it's a mess, that's what about it. It's a mess. That's why God's got a new world. This world's so bad, he's not fixing it. He's blowing it up. He so said, I go to prepare a place for you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Then in Titus 3, 6, he says, which he has shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that ye, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs of, according to the hope of eternal life. So God, God was at odds with us. Jesus came, turned God. Peace now could be on earth. Peace and goodwill toward men. And all a man has to do is turn and say, I'll put my faith in Christ. And now... We are sitting in the best place you could possibly be in. Just stay near to the one who brings peace. He knows right where we are. He knew where Jesus and Mary were when Jesus was on the cross. And Mary stood looking at her own son being crucified. He knew. And although that hour was a tragic hour, three days later, when that grave opened up, I'm going to talk about excited people. One day, the trumpet's going to sound. Yeah. Amen. The Lord will appear in the air. The dead in Christ will rise. And we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Can I just say, just walk with him. Just stay by his side. This peace on earth, that's a wonderful thing. We sat, at a, I don't know how many times we sat at a nice dinner that someone else bought for us. And, and um, don't do that this holiday season without thinking of who prepared the meal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Who bought the meal? Who prepared the meal? Who took time to clean up after you? Have you ever had family all over at the end of the day? Everybody have said, man, it's such a great time. They all leave and you fall down and, and you feel like you're dead. <laughs> you know, when have you left the house thinking, I'll bet grandma's feet hurt right now. <laughs> you never thought about that? They do. I'm married to a grandma. <laughs> There's every good thing you have, somebody paid for. And the peace that passes all understanding right here, Jesus bought it at great price. Don't go through life alone. Love him. Love his book. Love his people. Love his house. Don't go through, don't go through your Christian life, teenagers and adults, don't go through life ignoring the book. This is the love letter God gave you and me. And, and he, he's the one who gave his son so we can have peace. Love his book and Amen. love his people. Be good to the people of God. Yes. And love his house and, and love his work around the world. And love his name and lift up his name. My, my wife and I just thought I'm done with this. My wife and I were at a little gas station that coming back from a date we were on. And, and we got two of these juices. They're just really thick. They're, uh, I don't know, they must be like 90 carrots in one little jar or whatever, but anyway, um, we both had uh, these green machine smoothie, whatever, and, and, and she, she bumped one, another one of them, pulling out of the thing, and it hit the ground, hit the cement floor in this little convenience store, a little gas station, and, and the lid broke, and it just shot mango smoothie all over the floor, and uh, she, there wasn't a napkin in the place, it was a rougher part of town, there was no napkins, there was nothing, you know, because I don't know, homeless people take it, whatever. <laughs> The lady behind the counter said, I'll clean it up. And I said, I'll clean it up for you. She said, can't, against the rules. You all have to just wait. And she was so slow. She was so slow. <laughs> so there's a guy in line in front of us, and then the two of us, then somebody else comes in, and somebody else comes in, and she's getting the mop and ringing the mop out. <laughs> and so we get joking. The guy in front of us, he turns around and says, guess it's not really a big deal. we we'll wait a few minutes. And and one of us, I don't know if it was my wife or me or him, but one of us said something about, yeah, he, he, I think he used the word patience, and one of us thought of Job. He said, well, it could be Job. Job learned patience. And, 
And the calm, and so he and I are talking about Job and the patience of Job and all that Job went through. We're in the gas station. And this great big old guy, I mean, towered over me. He said, uh, don't mean to butt into your conversation, but who is this Job fella? <laughs> I'm never so glad for the slow mopping going on. We're in, we're in the, the A and O and AMP, some little tiny, tiny little convenience store. We're having a Bible study in trials, tribulations, and Job, and how God's good. Amen. Everyone in the room had to listen. I think God had angels down there saying, tell that woman to slow down. He's not down to the end of this store. <laughs> Talk about it to your kids and your grandkids. Talk about it to the neighbors. <coughs> don't, let, don't let beautiful Christmas lights go by without saying, man, I wonder, wonder how happy it is when we think of the light of the world. Just keep Jesus right up in front. Peace on earth. Very costly peace. Let's cherish it. All right? Father, bless us. Help us today.